are two greatest things that each and every one of us will experience in our lives that will both draw us into God and push us away from Him, our beauty and suffering. Bishop Janusz Sekeli, a bishop from a Western diocese in the country of Hungary, in his new book, The Door of Faith, helps us to understand how Christ is the key to combining these two in our lives so that we can have a full experience of the divine. If you would like to support this channel in any way, please do so through Buy Me A Coffee. Now on with part two of this interview. Here in the United States uh, and in different parts, you know, one of the first places that people would encounter beauty in terms of faith would be at the church. And many of our churches are very simple here, sometimes not very beautiful. And, and, and I find that uh, the beauty is so powerful because it kind of, it disarms you. It, it makes you almost put down your weapons and say, wow, I want to, I want to hear what the, what they have to say. You know, so, so, so it's, it's, it's really, really important. I think it's almost, um, you know, maybe half the bridge. The other one is goodness where both of those work together to, for the person to say, you know what, I want to hear what is being said. So, so I think it's, it, it's important how through the book you have that element of beauty there. That's exactly. Plato, for example, said that beauty is the irradiation of shining of truth. If somebody is right or true, then automatically it will be also beautiful. And if I see the beauty, I can discover the truth of reality. It's really true. I think um, I'm, I'm thinking of a quote. There was a lot of things that I would highlight, but um, but I, I one that was quoted either in the book as well as I think of someone like Saint Ignatius of Loyola that would be captivated by the beauty of the stars um, a, a, as a way of really contemplating God. And and that's, for instance, another thing that, that here in the United States and in many other countries, because of just light pollution, we never see the stars. So we never get this opportunity to see this nightly beauty that makes us think there must be something else out there. And, and so um, that's such an important element, I think, to present to people. There was a... You know, there were so many different things that I highlighted, and I think it might it, it might seem like a strange place to start, but um, something really struck me, let me see, about at the very end, so, so, so at the very, very end, and I think it might be an interesting thing to think about, but in your discussion at the very end of, of hell, one of the most interesting things that, that I've kind of thought about, and, and you phrased it, I think, better, is that, uh, is that it's a gift because it means that we, we don't have to say yes to God. We can say yes to God, but we can also say no. And I think, you know, presenting that to people, because sometimes that's one of the biggest obstacles, and to tell them it's, it's about that you have freedom to say no. And if God allows you to say no, I think that says something about God that he really respects our freedom. Maybe talk a little bit more about that. Exactly. God respects our freedom. Everyone can choose if he wants to live with God in his reign, in his kingdom of light, of love, of praise, of purity, of unselfishness, of righteousness or if he does not. Everyone have, has the, the free choice to, to choose the way of life that he desires. And God respects our choice. We have to become, become capable to eternity, capable to love, to unselfish goodness. The main task of our earthly life is to learn to love to transform our, li our lives into a gift to God and to others. Because the very essence of God is love and self-giving and purity and beauty and righteousness. And I have to learn to become like him, to be able to enter his life, his reign, to live his life. So that's the invitation of our Lord. And he respects our choice. 
it is not he who sends us to hell, but we ourselves, with our choices, are choosing this kind of life or this anti-life and then create for ourselves this terrible situation which is called in the Bible hell. I think sometimes maybe people have taken possibly the, the example of maybe certain missionaries and, and sometimes from their perspective they were so uh, zealous and desirous to bring people to the faith maybe even worried for their salvation that maybe at times they use pressure or different things like that to bring people to conversion but but that um but even if that was the case in, in different circumstances that sometimes maybe people think of it, it's it's beautiful just to know that we always have that choice and to let people have that freedom uh, i think i remember there was a friend of mine that uh, he, he had some sort of quote where um he, he quoted about his parents and he had a very beautiful family and he said that his parents' philosophy was something like, at first it sounded strange, but it, it was something like, uh, those who are allowed, those who are allowed to sin, sin less. And when I first heard that, I thought that sounds really strange. But what he was getting at was that his parents really trusted that they would choose the good, they would present the good to their children and then allow them to choose and trust that they would do good. And my friend, he he was, he's actually a priest. So, so he, with that freedom, he wanted to choose what was good and his sister as well, that they were such a beautiful family and seeing that freedom, that same freedom that, that God presents to us is, is really, uh, really something beautiful, I think. I think one of the problems of actual Christianity of the West is that we have lost a lot of this enthusiasm to give the gospel, to proclaim, to try to co convince others and to to find them the the true way and the reason of of this loss of uh, mis missionary enthusiasm is so that the the deep conviction the life uh, the human life has a, a, a great uh, chance to to gain the fullness in, in god or to lose it we have lost this deep conviction. We have lost the, the deep desire to win souls, uh, to use this medieval but very true uh, expression, to win souls for God, for Christ. I think it is important to discover the real task of human life, to discover God's love and to answer it with our self tradition one thing that that I've noticed uh, uh, here especially in the United States I uh, so I had my conversion in 2002 and it was it was actually um, through people that were Protestants and, and they uh, I think they had sort of a, a much more simple view of Christianity and part of that part of that was the idea of uh, of salvation of going to heaven part of it was also, the benefit in this life of uh, of having Jesus in your life, which I found very much, very much the the case. There's this really beautiful story that you have um, by. It, it was a simple worker, and, and he goes through and it, and it, they're asking him some questions about the faith, and then he says that he's ashamed that that he doesn't know he knows very little about Jesus. Um, it, it, to all these questions, he basically can't answer all the intellectual questions, but then he goes on to say that he was a heavy drinker, he was very unhappy, and he, he had a bad relationship. But, but then once he got to know Jesus, he stopped drinking and his wife, like his whole life changed. So I think um, so I think sometimes for people to, to remember the ways in which Jesus has changed their life, and then to present that to others, that, that there's this eternal dimension, but there's also immense benefits, even now in this life, of having faith. Yes, and Christianity today need uh, extremely authenticity. We need uh, saints of our century, modern saints, teachers, doctors, lawyers, but also simple workers who have an authentic, transformed life through their faith. 
we need shining families who, who live deeply the, the love and riches of the gospel. I think these renewed and authentic lives could be the main force of uh, a strong and powerful evangelization. Uh, it is very important, maybe the most important thing for the transmission of the gospel. Who were some of the people in your life that really witnessed to you with their authentic faith? I, I would imagine you might have answered that earlier on already with the example of your mother. Who are some other people, especially maybe those that led you to make that jump to go into the seminary and, and the priesthood? In the church of my childhood, there was a very old Franciscan priest. And I remember none of his phrases that he has preached on the pulpit because I was at the age of five and six and so on. So I was very, a very small child. But once in the sacristy, I didn't notice, I have uh, loosened, I have the shoe laces loosened. And he, who was all, already very old and moved with much difficulty, noticed that and much difficulty and made my shoes right. I was shocked to see this, that a very respected, a very good person, the most important in our church, a very sympathetic priest with much effort makes the shoelaces of a small child. It was very deeply impressed in my heart. Another person was the, the organ player of the church. She was a nun, but has made the profession in secret during the communist times. Mm -hmm. I, at the beginning, not even knew that she was a nun. I knew only that she sings in a beautiful way. She was also very beautiful, very tall. I didn't even notice that she was quite ill after some years. She sat already in a wheelchair. And one evening, we were several older boys. She was very happy to see that so many young people are there and said to us that I will tell you uh, very important thing. Wait a minute. And so we sat down. She went in the sacristy and put down all the lights. It was, it was total darkness. Only the small red light of the tabernacle was to be seen. And she returned in the church and said to us that Jesus is here. You can speak to him. Then it was a total silence for, for a long time. I didn't know what to think or what to say. I was very young, but these seconds were impressed in my heart for the whole life. So I was in a very authentic and living community in my childhood. I, That's really, yeah, I think of, uh... I can just imagine the scene where, where, where she was introducing you to Jesus, not just uh, as if in a classroom, but, but with this incredible conviction. And I imagine what she was sacrificing, whatever risk she was taking and, and, and being a nun during communist times and having to do that in secret, uh, that, that, you know, for her, Jesus was, was extremely real and that's who she was introducing you to. So, you know, I think that's something that we, we have to remember and be able to transmit that to our own children. A lot of times just with my children, I, I realize that that's how simple it is to show them a picture and say, this is Jesus, talk to him and, and almost let, let the grace of Jesus work in their hearts as it did in yours. Well, if I can tell also other deep experiences. When I was 14, we began with my a smaller brother to find another church which is uh, more full of young people and we have found a church of the franciscans in budapest where there was already a, a mass with more music and there was a, a huge group of young people 
and as I saw the the young choir uh, singing with shining faces, I suddenly knew that I have to belong to this community. So uh, in these years, until the, my entrance to the seminary, I was a member of this uh, community of young people. Three of us have become priests of, of this only one group. And also two of us became nuns secretly they don't not uh, tell too much about this but we knew what is their desire this group not only gathered for singing and for bible lectures but we visited also hospitals to help uh, sick people then we helped a lot of homeless people so it was a very living place of of christian faith and life it was the main experience of my uh, young age. That's beautiful. How how long have you been a, a bishop? How long were you a, a priest? And then uh, and then how long have you been a bishop? I was ordained deacon still in Bethlehem. Then I was ordained priest in Budapest. And then I was uh, a chaplain, uh, a helping a priest in a small village where we have had a lot of Roma people, poor people uh, around the village. That was also a deep uh, call to me to help and to try to transmit the gospel to them. Then I was priest also in different places in Budapest. And then I was appointed to become auxiliary bishop of Budapest. Mm -hmm. And I made uh, that uh, service for nine years and actually i am already a diocesan bishop to austria so that's the western part of hungary in some the city where saint martin okay yeah i was i was looking it up on the map it's it's right next to austria correct yes we have also Croatian speaking villages and Slovenian speaking villages and some German speaking. So I have to celebrate in four different languages. And did you learn those languages growing up or, 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 or are they similar enough where you can pronounce it? We had to learn Russian during the communist times. And so we have some uh, affinity to all the Slavic languages and that's why Croatian and Slovenian is quite easy. And afterwards, because of my uncle who fled in Germany, all my cousins are German speaking. And that's why all the family began to learn also German. It's amazing how God arranged all these little pieces so that you'd be able to, uh, to serve these people as well as maybe other priests that are able to do some of these same things. It's really beautiful. There's a quote in uh, some of the different, uh, throughout the book, one where you quote C.S. Lewis, where he says, uh, God whispers through our joys, speaks intelligibly through the voice of our conscience, and shouts aloud through our suffering. That, that, was, that was a section talking about suffering and, uh, and their response to it. I, that whole section, that, that whole part was amazing because you're, you talk about the different responses to suffering, what the Buddha, how he responded, um, Muhammad, and then and then Jesus and kind of the Christian perspective, um, w which obviously this is kind of a, a focus on. So maybe talk a little bit about how God has shouted loudly in your life, what has been some of your sufferings, and then we can maybe get into a little bit of uh, some of the things that the Buddha talks about, because I thought that was really interesting. I think sometimes some of that has influenced maybe negatively Christianity and we don't even know it. And I can sh share some about some experiences I had, but tell us about ways in which you've experienced suffering and how God has spoken through that. I can share one of the very important experiences of my childhood. When I was a small child, my parents always uh, taught us about a faraway relative, uh, a boy who was paralyzed 
and who was in hospital. And for many years, my parents thought that we as small children, we are five uh, brothers, we don't have to see this horrible uh, disease because all, only his head was growing, the, the body remained small like the body of a baby and he couldn't move even a finger or nothing. But when I was eight, my father took my hand and said to me that today I wish that we, we should go, you and me, to, to visit this uh, relative. And so we went. When I saw the hospital and all the, the paralyzed people there with uh, distorted bodies, it was terrible. And for some days I couldn't, uh, almost I couldn't speak. But afterwards, with my father, we went very often together to, to visit this. He was a very special young man, maybe five or six years older than me. He gathered and always told us jokes. He could play chess. We could uh, put the chess table uh, so that he could see it. And he told all the, the moves. He was very happy also if he won, also if he lost the party. So I was so encouraged that after some years, also alone, I began to visit him. And when he died, after a short period of time, I decided that I have to visit the others, the other people, the people are, uh, uh, who are in the hospital. And when I came out from the hospital after those visits, I felt a very deep peace and happiness in my heart. And slowly I discovered that the main thing in my life is not that I have to become the same clever and smart as my father. That was my first great ideal. It is a good, good one. But I discovered that the main goal of my life has to be to love, to give myself, to, to offer my life for God and for others. And I am very grateful to my father that he helped me to, to find this way. So it was a very deep touch of suffering. And at the same time, the, it was a very deep experience that God is present there. And that love and faith are stronger than this human disease, stronger than death. He is present there and he has overcome suffering and death. I think that's such an important thing for all of us to always know and understand and transmit to other people. Um, in some of the different scientists that, that, that I've ever read about or, or, or hear, almost, it, it seems to me that almost always when they're arguing against something, there was a quote at the very beginning that was so interesting it was, uh, I'm trying to think, it, it's almost, like you were saying that, that scientists evading the final conclusions. For instance, you were talking about um, the zero point in light, that, that you can trace light to, to a point of origin where you can say it began 13 billion years ago. And, and, you know, things like this make you start thinking, okay, something must have, what was there before this? You know, that it's a logical question, but but often I think maybe because of suffering that they've had in their life, they don't want to allow their mind to accept these truths that there could be a God. So, so, so sometimes I'll say something like that scientists will use intellectual arguments against God, but there's really emotional reasons behind those arguments. It's not real logic because at some point when you think about what they're saying, it doesn't make sense. You know, um, maybe talk a little bit about that and in, in some of the different scientists that you studied and maybe you see their conclusions and you think, how do they not make this jump and just say God is there? The science in many ways uh, have shown or has uh, discovered the fact that the universe 
has a temporal, a concrete beginning. For example, scientists or astronomers like Hubble, Benzias, Good, uh, and other have discovered the red shift, the uh, movement of the stars and galaxies that are started, uh, that have a, a very concrete beginning, or the cosmic microwave background, or the expansion of the universe which, which accelerates, that shows also that it has a beginning. It is not a pulsating universe, but has a very concrete beginning. Many scientists, when they arrive to this uh, obvious conclusion that the uh, material universe have, has a concrete beginning, they are very much embarrassed. And they try to avoid somehow this, uh, uh, for them, uh, not uh, an easy conclusion, an uncomfortable fact. And that's why they invent things. For example, the multiverse hypothesis is not a, a really scientific hypothesis. There are no data, or there are no measuring or experiments that really prove the existence of any other universe outside the one that we know. So that is not really a, a scientific hypothesis, much more a philosophical decision to explain somehow what is for them uh, uncomfortable or uh, which, which they cannot explain without the, the reality of the creator. Many of them say that the universe creates himself out of nothing, which is a philosophical nonsense. This I, yeah, even just to say that, I think, you, you know, an ordinary person that, that wouldn't be very intelligent would, would just think that that's ridiculous. How, how could that possibly happen? Is the universe is wonderful, full of rationality and order. In the universe, we have life, the wonder of life, and then we have human reason. And that wonderful, huge universe has to have a, a reason, a sufficient cause. Out of nothing will come out nothing. So the universe has to have a cause. I think many scientists agree in this, that somehow the existence of the universe is the proof of the creator and of his beauty and intelligence. And also the the deep experience of the human heart leads towards the same discovery. I have tried to explain this uh, quite in length in the book. Yes, uh, yeah, th those were uh, some of the parts that, that I really liked because some people, they, I think most people need both these, these intellectual explanations where, where they, they're able to go in depth. And I think sometimes in going in depth in things, it's almost like your mind gets lost in just amazement and wonder, kind of like the idea of staring at the stars and seeing something so profound that you could just keep learning about. I remember once learning this idea that in heaven, we're gonna keep learning about God because it's endless. And, and, and even just to think about that idea, you could get lost just wondering, what am I gonna learn? How am I gonna, know more about God, but he's infinite, you know, as well as these kind of very personal experiences that are s sort of day-to-day uh, -day experiences that touch your heart. I'm trying to think of, there were some examples of a one about, um, I think towards the end about someone that I think that the story of Carl Fisher at the very, very end where he was talking about his, uh, his wife, like he had written a letter to his wife and put it like in a matchbox, I believe. And it was at the very end, and then he was going to be sent on a train to, to the gulags or something like that. And somehow his wife found um, found the box almost miraculously, and, and and then he was left in wonder. And his 
and his comrades were encouraging him to to stay alive and wait for her. And then at the very end, it, it uh, it, it's uh, it, you say something like that um, that she was like an angel of hope, and, and just thinking that that all of us are called to be that to, to kind of be able to give other people these beautiful experiences of this type of faithful love and compassion towards others and things like that. Is it's a real story uh, that happened uh, towards the end of the Second World War. Many people in Germany were gathered and uh, sent to Russia, to the Soviet Union, in working camps and in terrible places. And also this, this man, this young uh, man, Karl Fischer, was captured in this way. And he was able to send a small message. And the bride received it. And then she walked 100 kilometers by foot. And she was able to find the, the bridegroom in the train already captured and uh, in the next uh, hours also sent to Russia, but they were able to, to see each other. And the bride told Carl uh, that, don't lose heart, I will wait for you. Ha uh, have uh, hope and confidence. And all the other uh, people, uh, the captured uh, people, they heard this conversation. And when Karl began to lose heart, they always told him that for such a bride, you have to struggle, you have to survive, you have to return. So that wonderful bride and, and her fidelity was the strength of, of this uh, young German uh, captured man. And I think you are 100% right that if we live with the same uh, trust and fidelity and hope, we can become angels of hope for others. Yeah, I think uh, I, I think a lot about how if people, if every person has this opportunity, and it really should come from our parents, but but often that's not the case. Sometimes it's from other people. If we each have this opportunity where someone in our life has shown us this profound love, in your case, maybe your parents, particularly maybe your mother, different experiences in mine as well. It's almost like that's the fertile ground in which you can understand the beauty and the logic of the universe in a way where you're not afraid to embrace God. Because it, it, it's almost like if, if you believe that love exists in this small way, you can think, well, then it must exist in this larger way. And so, so I think uh, that could be a, a very powerful way that we evangelize others, or at least help prepare them to receive the gospel simply by, by the way we treat them and the way the, the love and the compassion that we show to them. In the first three centuries of Christianity, the gospel was spread, first of all, by lay people and through their authentic lives. It, it was a very strong testimony of the risen Lord and of the gift that he has given to us. And in three, 300 years, Christianity really conquered the Roman Empire. And I think the quite tired Christianity of the West today needs a new to learn for these first Christians. To have the authenticity of life the courage to speak about our faith to and to have the deep conviction about the truth of our faith. I, th I think I would say definitely amen to that. Sometimes among different circles here in, in the US, people will be very without hope and they, and they think society is declining. How are we going to spread the faith? But I think in many ways, the early Christians had it more, much more difficult. That they didn't have all this history, you know, for, that we can use to build on. But but they're an amazing example. I think that that's exactly right. Whatever it was that they did, we really need to meditate on that and learn, and use that same technique, that same approach, that whatever that was, and then we can rebuild our our uh, our civilization, rebuild the Catholic Church throughout the world, help it grow and spread. I I think that's. They're probably the best examples for us. Yes. 
And the book wants to be only a small means to help this uh, uh, spreading of the gospel and to give give it to those who are who have these uh, questions and who have an open heart, an open heart to to receive it. For those uh, that are watching, I'm going to put a, a link here for you to be able to learn more about the book as well as about Bishop Janos and, and where you can purchase that book. Again, this book will be published within these next few days, I believe, on, on March 13th. So if you're watching this on March 13th, it's it's a really beautiful book. It's been a privilege for me to be able to read it as well as for us to have Bishop Janos here. Um, Bishop, any... any uh, closing thoughts and then if, if you wouldn't mind giving us your blessing thank you for the possibility i am very grateful for also for the editor to help us in in this endeavor to transmit or to spread the gospel my great passion of of my life is to live in christ i have this uh, deep conviction that human heart can be filled totally only from above, only by the grace and peace of God. And that's why I try to transmit this great gift also to others. So thank you for helping in this. And may Almighty God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit bless you and give his peace to all of the, all of you amen amen